Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and welcome to the second video in the guidelines of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death and we are having today a video regarding the workup of ventricular arrhythmias. We are following the same pathway in patients with ventricular arrhythmias or survivors of sudden cardiac death and the investigations that we are usually using in this case are lab testing, ECG, imaging, provocative testing, if you study and in some cases genetic testing. In the history we focus on three points which are features of arrhythmic syncope, family history of sudden cardiac death or family history of cardiovascular disease. The features of arrhythmic syncope are like absence of vagal prodrome, like the sweating, nausea and vomiting that may precede the syncope which are typical with vasovagal syncope and absence in arrhythmic syncope, the absence of common triggers of vasovagal syncope like psychological stress, prolonged standing, or orthostatic hypotension like sudden standing after supine or sitting. Occurrence in supine or sitting are one of the strongest features to suggest arrhythmic syncope and occurrence during or just after exercise. When we check the family history of sudden cardiac death, we need to check till the second level of family like the grandparents and if it is present, we need to check the age of death and any preceding cardiac symptoms in the decedent. Family history of drowning or car accidents should be included as in case of long QT syndrome or catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, this may suggest a cardiac cause and family history of sudden infant death syndrome also should be included. And when we check the family history of cardiovascular disease, we need to check about family history of syncopal attacks, heart failure or cardiomyopathies, pacemaker implantation at the age less than 50, epilepsy, which is very common that syncopal attacks are misdiagnosed as epileptic seizures, and deafness as it is a common feature in long QT syndrome. We usually have a quick clinical examination targeted to a cardiac patient. But there are some features that may be a clue towards a cause, like mid-systolic click by auscultation in case of arrhythmogenic mitral valve prolapse, which is a long topic to be discussed in a separate video, LVOT obstruction murmur with valsalva in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, lupus pernio and erythema nodosum, which are some of the dermatological features of sarcoidosis, as sarcoidosis may cause infiltrative cardiomyopathy, angiokeratoma in patients with Fabry's disease, which is one of the storage disease resulting in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, palmoplantar keratosis in some patients with arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy, like Naxos disease, which is an autosomal recessive type, and the Sanzilasma or Zansoma in patients with familial hyperlipidemia, which may result in premature coronary artery disease that may lead to ventricular arrhythmias or sudden cardiac death. We will order the routine lab testings that we usually order in any cardiac patient like blood picture, liver function, kidney function, electrolytes, and thyroid function. But here we need to mention the issue of BMP and N-terminal pro-BMP as they may have a role in identifying persons at increased risk of sudden cardiac deaths or patients with coronary artery disease, but so far there is no sufficient evidence to use the BMPs as a method to select the need for an ICD. What about the ACGs? The routine one that we have is a 12 lead surface ECG, which should be performed during tachycardia if possible to document and localize the VT and in between the episodes as it may show the underlying cause like long QT interval, Pugada features, pathological Q waves, voltage criteria of LVH or epsilon waves. But if we cannot record the ECG during tachycardia, we resort to the ambulatory ECG like halter recording for 24 up to 48 hours or in some patients with episodes occurring on remote intervals, we may use the intermittent monitoring over a longer period like patient activated ECG recorder or some smartphones and of course the implantable loop recorders can be used in patients with potentially life-threatening syncopal attacks but occurring on very far intervals. The exercise ECG may be extremely helpful in the diagnosis of certain patients. For example, patients with adrenergic dependent rhythm disturbance like some patients with idiopathic VT or patients with catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, it may show induction of monomorphic or even bidirectional 
VT and we should remember to have a four minute recovery time at least which may help to show the diagnosis of long QT syndrome with the failure of shortening of QT interval during exercise and still persistent during recovery. One of the classical methods is the signal averaged ECG which can detect the late potential in the terminal QRS segment using three time domain measurements like QRS duration, low amplitude signal duration, and root mean square voltage of the terminal, 40 millisecond. Of course, it contributes still to the diagnosis of ARVC. After this, we are going to the imaging test that we will ask for. The basic imaging is the echocardiography. We know that normal echocardiography in a patient with ventricular arrhythmia supports the diagnosis of primary electrical disease, usually known as channelopathy. And if it is abnormal, it can help to diagnose and risk stratify valvular disease, coronary artery disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC, and LV non-compaction. There is an additional feature in echo, which is the strain rate imaging, which can help to detect subtle changes in LV function when ejection fraction is still preserved, like the global longitudinal strain, and also it can assess inhomogeneous contraction, which is associated with increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia. The cardiac MRI with gadolinium is one of the essential tests in the workup of many patients with ventricular arrhythmias or survivors sudden cardiac death. Through tissue characterization, it can detect myocardial edema in patients with acute myocarditis, fibrosis in cardiomyopathies, infiltration and perfusion defects in ischemic patients. It is more sensitive than echo to diagnose specific disease like ARVC, LV non-compaction and epical aneurysms in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy besides the gadolinium which helped to detect scar as here it contributes to the risk stratification in hypertrophic, dilated, and potentially in mitral valve prolapse arrhythmic syndrome. The higher the area or the larger the area of late gadolinium enhancement, the larger the score and the higher the risk. The CT coronaries can help to exclude coronary stenosis in patients with intermediate to high pretest probability of coronary artery disease besides the diagnosis or exclusion of coronary anomalies that may be responsible for ventricular arrhythmias. The provocative testing are one of the investigations that we usually order when we have a suspicion or a specific provisional diagnosis as we don't order them routinely. Let's give some examples. The Admeline and Flecknide challenge tests are used in patients with suspected progada, and if they are not available in some countries, we can use propafenone. The indications are in patients with family history of Fugada syndrome or sudden arrhythmic death syndrome and patients with resuscitated or survivors of cardiac arrest with no evidence of structural heart disease, so we have a strong suspicion for Fugada syndrome. Here is the protocol dose and infusion rate of the two medication as Ajmaline and Flecknide are given intravenously while Propafenone is given orally. The positive findings that we are looking for are the appearance of frank type 1 progada syndrome in the ACG and better to put V1 and V2 in the second intercostal space to increase the sensitivity. But the contraindication of course in type 1, as here we don't need the provocative testing, it is a straightforward diagnosis. Patient with heart failure as we cannot give sodium channel blockers and be cautious if there is evidence of conduction disease as we may need temporary pacing wire. The criteria to stop the test if the patient develops VT, VF, type 1 progada syndrome as this is a positive finding, PVCs, widening of the QRS more than 150%. If there is VT or VF in this case, you need to have available intravenous isoprenaline or sodium bicarbonate to abort the attack and of course to have available DC shocks. The observation time for Adrenaline is for about 30 minutes if negative and 4 hours if positive test and to be done in the cath lab or with outpatient setting with full resuscitation equipment for the flicanide 4 hours if negative test and 24 hours if positive test. The epinephrine challenge test is used in patients with suspected catecholaminergic polymorphic VT and resuscitated cardiac arrest with or without structural heart disease when exercise test is not feasible and in patients with family history of sudden arrhythmic 
this syndrome. So we use it as a surrogate to the exercise testing. This is a protocol to give epinephrine and the positive findings that we are waiting for is three or more beats of polymorphic VT or bidirectional VT to diagnose CPVT. The contraindication is for QT prolongation more than or equal 480 milliseconds as we know that epinephrine may prolong the QT interval and the criteria to stop the test systolic blood pressure rise to more than or equal 200 non-sustained VT polymorphic VT more than 10 PVCs per minute T wave alternance which is a strong risk factor for tercet point or patient intolerance and if the symptoms persist after discontinuation you need to give intravenous metoprolol over one minute the observation time for 30 minutes and it is done in the cath lab or outpatient testing but in a location with full resuscitation equipment please remember that epinephrine challenge test is not anymore recommended to diagnose concealed long qt syndrome due to the high false positive results and the utility of exercise testing as a surrogate to diagnose concealed long QT syndrome to show the lack of shortening of QT interval and the persistence of long QT interval with recovery. The acetylcholine and ergonovine can be used to diagnose coronary vasospasm if we suspect it as a cause of ventricular arrhythmia or sudden cardiac arrest as here we give the medication intracronary in the cath lab and the positive results that we are waiting for are coronary artery spasm visualized during the procedure of course the contraindication which makes sense left main stenosis more than 50 percent three vessel disease two vessel disease with total occlusion neha class three or four heart failure symptom renal failure and the added contraindication for acetylcholine is severe bronchial asthma. We should have temporary wire for packup pacing as a patient may develop AV block with RCA vasospasm and there is a risk of cardiogenic shock with the vasospasm, especially if it occurred in the left main. And the observation time is for the normal post-procedure observation time after catheterization, as here we are speaking about a catheterization procedure where the medication is given intracronary. The adenosine test is used to exclude latent pre-excitation as we start with doses of 6, 12, 18 mg bolus up to maximum dose of 24 mg or till AV block appears and so it reveals the manifest pre-excitation and so the positive result is the identification of manifest pre-excitation. The contraindication are asthma, sinus node dysfunction or allergy and the side effects are bronchospasm bradycardia, systole, atrial fibrillation, seizures, and the antagonist to use in this case is thiophylline. Observation time for just five minutes in a place with resuscitation equipment. We need to mention another challenge test which is called the Veskin test to diagnose concealed long QT syndrome by sudden standing from the sitting position. As with the sudden standing, the RR interval normally shortens, but with delayed shortening of the QT interval. This is a normal phenomenon, but it is exaggerated in patients with long QT syndrome, resulting in lack or inadequate shortening of the corrected QT interval with tachycardia, resulting in a phenomenon of QT stretching. And when the patient resets, here the RR interval returns to the baseline, but with a still prolonged QT interval, so there is relative prolongation of the corrected QT at resting heart rate, which we call QT stunning. So together with the exercise test, Veskin test can be used to diagnose concealed long QT syndrome. Not all patients need EP study, but if we do it, at first we measure the AH interval and HV interval to exclude conduction disease, but the main reason to perform an EP study is the programmed electrical stimulation. Why do we do it? We do it to confirm the diagnosis of VT and induce mappable ventricular arrhythmias with non-inducibility being the ablation endpoint. How do we do it? We stimulate from two RV sites like RV apex and RV UT with two to three basic drive cycle lengths and introduction up to three extra stimuli with and without isoprenaline administration, which we famously called VT stimulation protocol. 
when do we do it or what is the indication patient with a structural heart disease and mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction so they have no clear indication for icd implantation who present with unexplained syncope and here we try to induce sustained monomorphic vt which can help to identify the underlying cause and predict subsequent events and beware that polymorphic VT and VF induction in structural heart disease during an AP study is considered a non-specific finding. Please also remember that so far there is no prognostic value for AP study in channelopathies or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but there may be some evidence to consider its use in Progada syndrome for risk stratification and sometimes for ablation in the RVOT epicardium in patients with recurrent VT or VT storm and it may have some clinical implications in patients with myotonic dystrophy. There is an added benefit for EP studies that endocardial voltage mapping may help to differentiate ARVC from benign outflow tract VT. As an outflow tract which is an idiopathic VT it is just a single focus while in ARVC there are multiple foci related to an early scar formation and sometimes it may help for targeting biopsy in suspected myocarditis, ARVC and sarcoidosis cases as instead of the old way to have an endomyocardial biopsy, I am targeting the specific area of the pathological lesion to have a biopsy and confirm the diagnosis. The last investigation that is usually misunderstood is genetic testing. We remember that the American College of Medical Genetics has put some classes for genetic variants. Class 5 for pathogenic, which is the most strong genetic mutation. Class 4, likely pathogenic. Class 3, uncertain significance. Class 2, likely benign. And class 1, benign variants. We focus here on class 5 and class 4 which are considered genetic mutations that may be responsible for a specific channelopathies or cardiomyopathies. So the detection can be used for confirmation of diagnosis in broadband, who is the first affected family member, for initial diagnosis of relatives of victims of sudden cardiac death or survivors of sudden cardiac arrest, and it may help to guide therapy or prognosis. And kindly note that genetic testing should be undertaken only by a multidisciplinary team, including experts who have skills to counsel on the results of the test if they are uncertain and what is the clinical implication, and experienced cardiologists who are able to direct testing to the correct phenotype. So we are not ordering a panel of genes. We are having a specific provisional diagnosis that we are searching for its genetic mutation and beware that negative results do not exclude a diagnosis and should not be used for this purpose that's why clinical diagnosis is essential so the recommendations here are focusing on the genetic testing they are indicated in a living or deceased individual with a likely genetic base and the risk of ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death when a putative causative variant is identified we should evaluate for pathogenicity using an internationally accepted framework. That's why an expert in medical genetics is needed in the multidisciplinary team. And if class 4 or class 5 variant has been identified in the individual, we should have genetic testing for the first degree, symptomatic relatives, and obligate carriers. And the big no related to genetic testing is that we should not undertake genetic testing in index patients with insufficient evidence of a genetic disease. So you should have a provisional diagnosis for a genetic disease that you need to confirm before asking for a genetic test. So we have reached the end of our video on the workup of ventricular arrhythmias and the take home message that we should follow the same rule of meticulous history taking, examination, and then start by the basic non-invasive testing going into the more complex test according to the patient's clinical presentation and please remember that genetic testing is not a routine test or a panel of genes that you request without a provisional diagnosis of a genetic disease. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for the next video in the guidelines of ventricular arrhythmia and the five clinical scenarios.